You okay to share your screen, Laura? Yeah, fabulous. I will do. Can everyone see that one okay? Yeah. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so thank you, um, Heather, for the lovely introduction. At least I don't need to sort of re restate sort of who I am and sort of where I'm from. Um, I will just sort of say that my name is Dr. Laura Jenkins and I do work at Loughborough University. Um, a lot of my teaching is, or a lot of my work is teaching focused. Um, so the research that I tend to do and the, the teaching activities that I tend to do are um, very, very student centred. So we try to sort of um, improve the, the student experience as well. So what I'm going to do today is talk about um, one of the tools in which we do use at Loughborough, which is called Vivox. And this is an interactive polling tool. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of using it as a method of formative feedback. Uh, we use it for a variety of different things. And I will mention those as we go along today, but mainly to focus upon sort of the formative feedback methods as well. So I'm not going to sort of reintroduce myself again, but the one thing that I am just going to mention is that because I am more of a, a teaching focused academic, my research is sort of quite teaching focused now. So a lot of my final year undergraduate students are currently looking at um, teaching aspects such as academic misconduct and how different um, personality traits can affect those as well. And um, hopefully in the upcoming years, I'll then have some students who look at more um, pedagogical methods of the use of Evox and the use of other activities. Um, but for now, um, my students tend to just focus more upon, um, we'll see the darker side of personality in relation to teaching. So what I'm going to do today is give a little overview of um, what formative feedback is and why it's important. Um, it's important for psychology in my context, but it's important across education. So if anyone from you know, outside of university or higher education is watching this. It's not just sort of university focused to this. You can use Revox in any educational setting. I'll talk about previous ways in which I've provided formative feedback. Some ways have worked, some ways haven't. Um, and I'll explain why we now tend to use Revox at Loughborough University. So I've used it in many, many situations. So in lecture situations, in sort of practical workshop situations, uh, we also use it as things like when we do open days at Loughborough as well, just to give the potential or the prospective students a little taste of what VVOX is and, you know, how it engages our students. And I'll try and give you a little demonstration of it as well. Um, to sort of finish off, I'll then talk about the advantages and disadvantages of VVOX and why we're continuing to use it, but also the things that you have to be careful of when you're using Vivox, because while, as with any other, any software, it's good to a point, but you still have to be mindful of things like the amount of time that you do use it. And then I'll briefly mention some of the other tools available, um, because I see it's not just solely about Vivox today. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about formative feedback. Now, formative feedback is very important in any educational institution. So that's even primary school age, up to secondary school age, and all the way across to university and beyond. Now it's important because educators themselves can generate formative feedback and it's designed to engage students um, and to engage learners to allow them to reflect upon um, how they learn and sort of how they orient their different learning activities. Now, what we can do as educators is which we, we can allow students to evaluate their own learning, to understand and um, to allow students to understand whether their learning is being successful or not. And as educators, no matter what level we educate at, we have different learning outcomes per lecture, per module. And we also use formative feedback to allow us as educators to see whether we are progressing the students to meeting those learning outcomes as well. So that's just sort of a little bit of a definition there. Now, in general, we try to conduct formative feedback quite regularly. So in the modules I teach, I tend to do it sort of every lecture, or if I'm not teaching lectures, it's normally sort of in the seminar contexts as well. And I've done it across a variety of educational settings as well. So I've taught, um, given lectures to different schools, children of all ages and I've used Vivox um, at all levels as well and I find that 
even children as young as sort of six and seven do quite enjoy using VVox as well. So it's not just a, um, a tool that can be used with adults. As long as the children understand how to use it, then that is absolutely fine. You know, it's used quite well. Now, in terms of formative feedback, it can take a number of forms. So we can do it in written form. So you may um, ask the students to submit a draft of a piece of coursework. That would be classed as formative feedback. We also can do it in spoken forms as well. And that this is where we tend to have issues because you find that sometimes the spoken forms of formative feedback are um, students tend to pay less attention to it because sometimes they don't actually realise the spoken forms of formative feedback are actually feedback. Um, so, for example, when we answer questions in lectures or we give students questions that they then respond to, and we as educators then sort of talk around those questions, that is classed as spoken formative feedback. But sometimes we have issues because students don't fully understand why we are doing it or how we are doing it. And I'll explain a little bit later on um, about how at Loughborough that we are trying to not solve that problem, but just to um, try and encourage students to um, help them understand what formative feedback is. Now, Bukinski in 2009 um, did tell us that the frequency of formative feedback is important because it can be motivational, it can be informative and it can be corrective as well. And I don't mean corrective in a negative or a harsh way. Uh, when I'm giving lectures, um, if a student gets an answer wrong, I won't sort of, um, you know, harshly say to a student, no, that's wrong. I'll try and get the student to think about it in a different way. So without directly saying, no, the answer is incorrect, I'll maybe say something along the lines of, you know, try and expand your thoughts or have you thought about it in another way or just to allow the student to think um, sort of on the spot as well. And normally that does sort of motivate the students as well to be a bit more involved in the activities. Now, in general, in any educational setting, <coughs> excuse me, Formative feedback is important because it allows students to monitor their own progress. So do the students understand the content? Are they progressing well through different assessments? And in terms of when we give formative feedback in lecture situations, for example, it allows students to see if they understand what we are talking about. So I teach areas of memory, for example, um, sometimes biological psychology, which are quite complicated um, concepts to for anybody to um, try and understand and what I do is I tend to put those VVOX activities in there just so students can try and track their own progress as well. It also allows students to understand where they are struggling and then students can then maybe try and tailor their revision um, to that concept as well but as educators it allows us to then provide more support as well so if we can see that a student um, completes a VVOX activity and doesn't sort of respond to the questions very well, we as educators can then provide students with a bit more support, whether that's sort of more activities with some of the other tools that I'll talk about today, or just general talking with the students sometimes helps as well. Now, there's been quite a bit of research out there that suggests that formative feedback in whatever format can enhance student performance. And today, while I'm not gonna directly talk about that, I can say that, we're going to talk more about the fact that it sort of enhances that student experience as well. And obviously, we don't monitor student performance in terms of how well they engage with um, VVOX activities because it's fully anonymous. But I'll try and turn that on its head a little bit and talk a bit about why VVOX is important in terms of formative feedback and why we also use it at Loughborough as well. Apologies, I'm just lost my mouse. So, in general, what makes good feedback? So. Tadok and Denik in 2013 explains that good feedback should help clarify the expected standard and provide opportunities to close the gap between the actual and desired performance. So it closes that gap between what the students already know, what the students would like to know, and also what the students feel that their level of achievement should be. Now, what we need to do is we need to identify that performance gap and what we will do is we, we can only do that if the actual performance of the student is known and if it's observed. If we don't have um, sort of grades from students, if we didn't have coursework marks from students or um, even things like A-level marks from students, we wouldn't be able to pitch 
the feedback at the appropriate level. Um, and what we can do is once we have a general idea of how we feel students are progressing, um, we can then provide um, an appropriate level of feedback. Um, so the feedback that we might give to primary school children, you know, would be completely different to the standard and level of feedback that we would give to undergraduate students as well. Now, Tuttle and Denick did take these ideas from Vygotsky. So if you've studied psychology, areas of developmental psychology, Vygotsky came up with the term called scaffolding. And that is where an adult or a teacher will support a student in developing an understanding of different concepts. And this is a similar concept to that. Feedback allows educators um, to sort of provide stepping stones for students, to give students a bit of a support in terms of when they are um, revising for different topics, for example, or studying towards a piece of coursework as well. So it's, it's not just feedback in terms of exam, it's feedback across um, sort of all aspects of the module. Now, formative feedback is also important because I have found that it promotes peer learning. So at Loughborough, we've recently introduced something called peer assisted learning. And in those sessions, we ask um, students of a higher year group to support students of lower year groups as well. And what we do is the students in those sessions do then provide um, the younger students or the students in the lower year groups with formative feedback. And at the minute, we found that it is working. It is supporting students, it's promoting peer learning as well. And this is where educators and lecturers don't really get involved. So it's solely about peer learning. In terms of formative feedback, when we give formative feedback across the modules, it actually encourages the use of material across the module. Now at Loughborough, and I'm assuming this could be in other institutions as well, students always question about why they are being taught certain things if you're not going to be assessed on it. So one of the ways or one of the good things about using formative feedback is that we can technically informally assess students upon content as we deliver it. So students can learn to use it. And it means that they are not just going to look at that content right at the end of the module as well. And hopefully this will then in turn increase motivation. It will increase understanding of the content. And as we said before, when students pick up on ideas that they are not sure of, that information is then relayed to the educator, the lecturer. And this means that we can then provide further support mechanisms. We can put different things in place, such as you know worksheets and other types of activities. Now, Gibbs and Simpson in 2004 did actually suggest that there are six key drivers out there that will um, explain to us how feedback can positively influence performance. And this is a performance just in education in general. So in terms of undergraduate education and school education as well. They did suggest that feedback needs to be sufficient and in frequency and detail. So don't just give feedback, you know, once every two or three weeks make it quite consistent across the module. So in my lectures, if I use VVox or another feedback tool, I'll sort of do it every maybe 20 to 30 minutes. And then it means I am then giving students sort of feedback as we go along and I'm not waiting till week 12 at the end of the semester. We need to ensure also that feedback, <coughs> excuse me, focuses upon the student performance. So in, when we talk about VVox, which I'll explain shortly, um, it actually tells the, the room in general whether people are getting answers correct or incorrect. So it's anonymous and no names are there. But if students can see and they have control over those actions, this is where feedback actually positively influences performance. So if we gave students questions and didn't actually show how they were responding, students would never, ever know how they are performing in general. And then it potentially could mean that they would disengage with that content. We also need to ensure feedback is timely as well. And this is in terms of um, formative feedback, where we maybe provide formative feedback outside of a lecture situation. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, a couple of tools that we can use outside of the lecture situations as well. But we need to do it within a timely manner so that that feedback can then be used for future applications. So if the feedback is at the end of a module, you need to ensure that the student can then use that feedback in other modules. So at the minute I run um, an applied cognitive research module, 
that module then feeds into the final year dissertation module. So any feedback that I give the students in that applied cognitive research module, they can then use when they are completing their dissertation. So it's not just a case of students will get the feedback and then forget about it. We need to ensure that the feedback is appropriate for the assessment and its criteria. So in terms of the assessments, whether that's a piece of coursework or an exam, that assessment will be designed for a specific reason and to meet different outcomes of the module. And we need to ensure that the feedback reflects that as well. If a student is completing a piece of coursework, ensure, <coughs> excuse me, ensure that that coursework feedback, the formative feedback is appropriate. So you're not going to be talking about things like multiple choice questions if the student is completing a piece of written coursework, such as an essay. You'd maybe talk about things such as writing style or, you know, how much uh, research has been used there. Feedback needs to also be appropriate in terms of um, students' conception of learning and their knowledge. So if students don't understand why they are learning or how they are learning, then in general, they won't understand why feedback is being given or why it's important. And I'll explain a little bit later on when we talk about the issues with formative feedback, what we are doing at Loughborough to try and um, sort of encourage the use of feedback and we are hopefully trying to allow students to understand why feedback is important and when we give that feedback as well. And as a final point, the last key driver is that feedback needs to be attended and acted on. So as we progress through the, um, the semester, we tend to use things um, such as tools such as VVOX for uh, mid-module feedback. And what we do is we explicitly explain to the students how we have acted up on that as well. So in terms of lect lectures and VVOX, if we use VVOX and we can see students are struggling, what I tend to do is I will then say to students, OK, I, I can see that you're struggling with that question and then explain to students what I'm going to do. So some of the things that I can then put in place. So it's about me actively showing the students that, you know, that feedback is being acted upon then as well. So I've worked in quite a few different institutions, as Heather talked about in the introduction. And in my teaching career over the past sort of 10, 11 years, I've used quite um, a few methods um, of formative feedback. So I have used class quizzes and these have been a lot of paper based methods. But one of the issues with those class quizzes is you have to spend time making them. You have to then print them off. If students don't turn up, it is a little bit of a waste of a resource, um, especially since sort of, you know, COVID happened and a lot of things are online now. We tend to do direct questions from the lecturer. As you can probably guess, sometimes that's not really received very well because students are quite reluctant to put up their hands and to sort of answer questions in front of um, other students. So I teach up to 350 students and it is very, very rare that a student will put their hand up and um, sort of, you know, and actively answer a question. And sometimes it does feel like pulling teeth a little bit. So this is where VVOX comes in quite useful. We've also got things such as hands up activities. So sometimes I will ask questions in a class, ask students to put their hands up. But one of the issues with that is that it doesn't really engage the students. You know, anyone <coughs> excuse me, can put their hand up. They don't actually have to actively listen to what's going on. If they see another student put their hands up, the hand goes up and that's pretty much everything done. Another thing we encourage is discussions with other students. But as you can imagine, when you've got a cohort of 350 students, we can't sort of go around the lecture theatre and discuss things with every single student. So we need to rely on the students to talk about the appropriate discussions. So again, this is one of the ways in which we can integrate VVOX. We can encourage discussions, but then VVOX will, you know, build upon that as well. Now, in general, these methods do give students some form of formative feedback and they all do it in a slightly different way, whether that's, you know, through the quizzes or through the hands up activities. But we do have one major issue with all types of the previous methods that I've used. And that issue is a lack of engagement. So that's in lecture situations. It's in sort of smaller seminar situations um, online and offline as well. So it's not just a case of, you know, face-to-face -face lectures there'll be a bit of disengagement it's sort of across the board <coughs> and I've spoken to colleagues at other universities and it's it's the same in quite a few different institutions 
Now, Johnson has explained some reasons and some um, ways in which sort of we can look into these reasons further. So why do students sort of not engage with those um, formative activities? And one of the reasons is that students tend to have a negative attitude about taking part in different activities. What you will find is that students um, will see it as um, a bit of a waste of time. And I've had students sort of say that to me in the past. Uh, but when you then sit students down and explain why we do sort of different activities and lectures, they do understand why we do them and then they engage a little bit more. There's also a lack of willingness. So, for example, you often find that, um, especially with things like the hands up activities, students won't actively take part because what we can do is we can actually pinpoint the students and are putting their hands up and we could potentially ask more questions as well as a lecturer I tend not to do that because we do have students with adjustments in place and putting students on the spot is sort of not one of the things that I tend to do as an educator I really didn't like it when I was doing my undergrad degree so it's not one of the things which I've kind of brought forward in my teaching and that sort of links in the confidence as well some students have a lack of confidence they're scared about getting questions wrong as an educator, what we try to do is build up on that confidence, and this is where VVOX can come in as well. Johnson did say that belief of impact is one of those important things that stop students from engaging. So at Loughborough, and again at other institutions as well, we often get questions from students about why they are taking part in activities that are not directly assessed. So we will give students different activities, whether that's via VVOX or um, different ways. And because these don't directly contribute to a portion of the grade, students will not believe that they have any form of impact and we have to sort of go through that again. And finally, um, a lack of understanding. So students might not understand what feedback is and also, on the contrary, staff also may not, not fully explain um, what form of the feedback is and why it's important. So that's why we tend to use VVOX as well. So at Loughborough, what we do is we are trying to change this by increasing engagement within the classes. This is lectures and in workshops as well. We praise students a lot for engaging and participating. So even by just saying thank you, that hopefully encourages students to participate a little bit more. And this in turn will then change those negative views, those negative views of engaging to more positive ones. And what we do is at Loughborough, we've, we've sort of tried to embed VVOX into um, our lectures, our practical workshops to make learning a little bit more fun and to increase that engagement. But also when we use VVOX, it allows students to see when and how and why we are then providing that formative feedback. Please excuse me. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about VVOX and what it is and why we use it at Loughborough University and hopefully do a little demonstration as well over the next few minutes. So in terms of VVOX, we have embedded this into an app within Loughborough. So students have access to the My Loughborough app and you can see there on the screen that, excuse me, it is, As you can tell, I've got quite a bad cough, so I do apologise. Now, but the My Loughborough app is... Um... <laughs> what I'm going to do is just mute uh, my microphone. Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not coughing anymore. Laura, so the My Loughborough app... Laura, sorry, to just, if you want to take a little minute's break, I know you've got that terrible cough thing. Yeah. Please stay, OK? That's fine. I'm OK. The cough's passed a little bit. Um... <laughs> So students, I'll be back in a moment. Dear Laura, there's nothing worse. Oh my goodness. I apologise. I've, I've just recovered from bronchitis and the cough's lingering for quite a while. Um, don't worry, don't worry. Have you got water and everything? Yeah, there? yeah. I've, I've got coffee, I've got water, um, but sometimes they don't actually work. Um, so yeah. I, I'm okay now. I've it's it's settled down a little bit. It's do what you need to do. Fab. It's normally just after I've spoken for a while and I've been talking for a little bit. Um, so anyway, back to um, our students at Loughborough. We ask students to download the My Loughborough app. So this gives students access to things like the timetable and their emails. 
but it also gives them direct access to Vivox as well. Now, Vivox is a polling app that we use at Loughborough in our lectures, in our seminars, and students can literally go through the app and they can then click on the in-class activity and they can go directly to Vivox. Students then just log into the session that the lecturer has posted online. So this will be a nine digit code. And this means the students then can either use tablets or their phones as well. So it's really, really accessible to those students who actually have um, sort of the, the technology with them. They can also do this online by going to vivox.app. So it's not all sort of phone based. Any device Vivox can be used on. And that's one of the good things about it as well. Now, in terms of the staff interface, um, staff at Loughborough or staff anywhere will log into Vivox and they will see this platform here. So they can log in at the side there. If your institution has um, an institutional account, go through your IT services to um, get, a, get an account. And then what you can do is your account will be then linked up to your university as well. So Loughborough, all of our accounts are accessed via um, our Loughborough email addresses. So therefore the interface is tailored a little bit more to Loughborough University as well. When you log in, so from a staff point of view, what you can see there is that for every lecture, for every session that you give, there is actually um, a different um, sort of session with a, a nine digit ID there. So the example on the screen there was a revision session I gave um, last year for an introduction to psychology module. And you can see there, there was a nine digit code. In this case, I only had 10 students in the class, so nine of them logged in. But you can see on the other two sessions there, um, or on the session on the left hand side, there were 39 students in that session. You can get loads of students in the sessions um, from, I've had sort of, you know, up to 400 students in one session, and it still works just as well, whether you've got a small amount of students or a larger amount of students there as well. Once you've logged into a session, so this is just the example of the, the revision session from last year, you can then access different things. So you can have um, a poll, um, so the sort of the multiple choice responses, you can do a Q&A session, you can even give surveys which students can access outside of the lecture situation as well. So what I'm going to do is give some demonstrations about uh, the polling questions and I'll also give you an example of sort of how we use the Q&A session um, as well. Every question that you give to the students is then embedded into your Vivox online account. So even if you don't save the PowerPoint at the end of the lecture, everything and all of the responses are in there as well. So you can download the data, have a look, see how many students took part as well, which is one of the good things about Vivox as well. In terms of PowerPoint, it's I'm not going to say it's um, a simple piece of um, software to use, but it's not the most difficult, in honesty. Once you've downloaded the plugin, you can see at the top of the screen there, Vivox is then embedded. And what you do is you click on the tab at the top there, click on the add poll slide top. And what you can do is if I've added to this slide, you then type your question into the box, type in any potential responses and then click add. So in the example that I've got there, it would be a multiple choice question. But another example that I'm going to show you is a word cloud and a rating question as well. So in this, because this is from uh, my Loughborough account, there's, there's three different versions of questions that we can give students over the course of a lecture. So we use Vivox at Loughborough for many reasons, and it's grown over the past few years. So when I first started at Loughborough in 2018, I had no idea what Vivox was. And it was only sort of a colleague who said to me, oh, have you tried using Vivox? I then attended some um, sessions that um, explained what Vivox was. And essentially, we do it to en uh, encourage engagement within the classes. It stops students sitting there for two hours, you know, sort of wandering around. Sort of after 30 minutes, we know students can only concentrate for a short amount of time. So normally in my lectures, every 15 to 30 minutes, I will place a little activity in there and it will just increase engagement a little bit more. We also um, have suggested that it, it um, increases inclusivity. So some students have adjustments in place. They are not comfortable in sharing ideas and talking to other students. And Vivox is fully anonymous. So this allows students to engage with different activities as well. 
it gives us a little bit of entertainment. So apparently Vivox has a profanity filter. Because all of my lectures are recorded, I can't test it out. But please feel free if you ever use Vivox, please do test it out. So students can't use offensive language because what apparently happens is this then is embedded or it goes to the staff member before it is displayed on the screen. We're trying to make learning a little bit more enjoyable with this. So we're not just sitting there directly lecturing for two or three hours. Um, and it just gives the students a little bit of a break as well. We've received quite a lot of positive feedback, as I'll talk about in a few moments time. But the main thing is that it is fully anonymous. So what we find is that students don't have names, so they are more likely to engage with the VVOX process. So what I'm going to do now is give you a quick demonstration of VVOX. So the first thing that I'd like everyone to do is please, because you're obviously not Loughborough students, is please just go to vvox.app. And then once you've logged in, um, type in that nine digit code. Um, I'll give you a moment or two just to log in. Um, and hopefully I'll try and give you a demonstration of some of the activities. If they don't work, I do have examples of what um, some of the answers could look like. But I'll give you a moment just to log in. It's the first time in a long time I've used this on Zoom, so please do shout if nothing's working. OK, so when we go through these activities, that little meeting ID will still be on the bottom of the screen. Um, and this is what I have found. Students tend to forget um, that nine digit code. So what I do is when the questions are on the screen, I will also put that nine digit code on the bottom of the screen there, just as a reminder for the students. So. Let's see if this will work. So what I'd like you to do is you should be now logged into VVOX and you should see a little box. And what I'd like you to do is just in the box, type one word of what comes to mind when you think of teaching. Can we teach anything related to teaching? Um, again, if this doesn't seem to work, do let me know. Um, and we'll, I can then just move on to the examples. But I'll give you a moment to do that. What you can do is if you're sort of time limited, you can put a timer on the screen so that the questions close after maybe 20, 30, 40 seconds. But obviously today, because people are new to VVOX, I didn't want to put a timer on um, just in case people were um, struggling with adding in different words into the VVOX activities. So I'll give you another moment and then we'll flick on to the next activity. So I'm hoping that when people have put um, some sort of words in the boxes, these will appear on the screen when I press the button. Um, if they don't, as I see, I've got examples um, because, again, I haven't used this with Zoom for quite some time. So I'm going to close this now, um, and it may take a moment just to um, appear on the screen. So just bear with me. There you go. So as you can see there, you've put in some fabulous words. Lovely, thank you very much. The bigger words are the words where um, participants have kind of typed in more. So quite a few of you must have put the word learning in. We've also got things like complexity and dialogue and knowledge. Those are all excellent things associated with teaching. This works really well with any size group of students. So I've done it with groups of 10 students, with 15 students, even with 350 students. And as you can imagine, when this is presented on a big screen, you, you can imagine some of the, the quite complex word clouds that we get with VVOX. And what we do is educators, I will then talk through some of these words and it just gives me a bit of an understanding as to where the students' minds are at. So when I am teaching my cognitive lectures, I tend to get students to start off with an activity saying, what do you know about cognitive psychology? And at least this gives me an understanding about how much knowledge the students already have. What you will find is that you can embed these into your PowerPoint slides and everything that's displayed on the screen will then be put into your VVOX um, dashboard when you log in as well. So you can then see all of the words that have been put in after the lecture as well. 
So the next type of question is a multiple choice question. So do you teach any large groups of students at any academic level? And um, we have yes, no, or prefer not to say. Um, again, I'll only give you sort of a few seconds to do this one, but that should come up on your tablet or your phone or whatever device you are using. These are the, the types of questions that I tend to use quite a lot in my lectures. I'll use multiple choice questions as recap questions from the previous lecture as well. And I'll just close that one because I'm very sort of aware of the time as well. So excellent. You can all see there that the demonstration has gone quite well and that 70% of you, you know, teach large groups of students. The final type of question is a sort of rating question. So how happy are you today on a scale of one to five? Um, again, just take a few seconds to try and respond to that one as well. With these questions, what we tend to do is give students a graph or an image and then get students to rate on a scale of maybe how much they understand the image, how much they don't understand the image as well. And that allows us as educators to then talk about them a little bit more. So again, you can see there, excellent, well done. So again, these are rating scale questions. So that was just a brief demonstration of how VWOX can be incorporated into um, lecture situations. Now, I did have some examples in case VWOX didn't work, so I will skip those examples just so I'm not repeating the information. But in terms of the Q&A on the screen, students can, if you have this on a PowerPoint screen, students can simply ask questions. So for example, where can we find the reading for the lecture? Students can ask that question and then the lecturer can respond to that either via VBOX themselves or on the PowerPoint screen. And as you can see there, everything is fully anonymous. So students' names will never sort of appear alongside their comments. And to be honest, I find that students engage really well with this because you'll find that loads and loads of questions will pop up at a time. So for the last sort of little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about the teaching best practice application that we put in at Loughborough now. What we did is we um, used the implement implementation of VVOX in a module. We wrote this up as a case study and submitted it to um, the enhanced academic practice team. And unfortunately, the case study wasn't successful. Um, but what it has allowed us to do is work with the enhanced academic practice team at Loughborough University to develop a tool to show staff how they can implement VVOX in terms of that um, formative feedback as well. So what we have done is at Loughborough, we have something called TEL guides, the Technology Enhanced Learning Guides. My application has now gone on to there as um, a way of explaining to new members of staff how to use VVOX as well. So if anybody ever needs would like me to share those documents, I can do as well. I think Caroline is going to share those in the post that she will do after the talk as well. Now, the background to the case study basically allowed us to question um, feedback in terms of universities across the UK. And in general, we have issues with feedback because one, sometimes it's not constructive enough. Two, um, students don't understand what feedback is as well and what we wanted to do is we wanted to sort of show how feedback could be implemented in a module where there was a lack of engagement and what we did is we took some research from Kemba and colleagues who actually suggested that feedback can improve the quality of teaching and what we did is I implemented this in a module at Loughborough University a psychology module and then I gathered feedback from the students just to kind of see whether they thought that feedback VVOX was a good way of providing feedback and whether it improved that learning experience for the students. In general, the research has demonstrated that um, tools, interactive tools, are quite successful. But one of the issues with the tools is that they can be either complex to use, they are not anonymous. VVOX helps with all of those things. VVOX is anonymous, it's fairly simple to use, and it can be used upon any device as well and in multiple formats either online or offline so what we did is we took vvox and we selected a class where there was limited engagement in terms of the module and what we did is we then um, implemented vvox over the course of a few different um, months so we taught developmental psychology biological and cognitive psychology 
and embed Vivox into the lectures and the seminars. Now that module was a foundations module and we had approximately 60 students on that module. So it was a, a decent cohort size. And what we did is every two hour lecture, we had a few different Vivox activities. And then in the seminars, we would use things such as the Q&A sessions um, and also activities which would allow more discussion. And then at the end of that, we did take module feedback. So we took feedback in the middle of the module and also at the end as well. Now the results of us implementing this um, VVOX investigation was quite good. In the staff student liaison committee, they heard nothing but positive feedback about VVOX and they had loads of different things which were then supported by emails from the students and from the course reps. So for example, a lot of the students said that VVOX, the VVOX activities helped understanding of the content and it wasn't just a repeat of the information. So as I've previously said, each week I would have a little recap and that would mean the students could then understand whether they themselves had understood the previous content. VVOX is anonymous and the students really appreciated that because it allowed them to boost their own confidence in responding to different questions. And quite a few of the students had never used VVOX before. This was a foundations module, so it was um, the, the stage of an academic career um, or academic education, the step before first year undergraduates. So what this means is that students have just come from either a BTEC background or maybe a background that um, was a bit less academic in nature as well. One student particularly commented and said it allowed me as the lecturer to then explain the answers and that's something that they had not gotten in their previous educational institution. So I felt that was a really positive step in terms of using VVOX as well. We then did some really informal uh, mid-module feedback and again it was fairly similar results. Students found the lectures more interesting with VVOX, they really enjoyed those activities and one of the comments that kind of struck me a little bit is that one student actually found it really good in terms of the word clouds because because it was anonymous, they, they felt more confident, they knew they weren't going to be laughed at if they completely typed in a random word that had nothing to do with those answers. And to be honest, this made it a little bit more fun because everything was anonymous. We couldn't then pinpoint if students did put any sort of, you know, funny words in there. And we, we do encourage students to, you know, um, not be as serious with VBOX activities as well. We did monitor attendance at lectures as well, and we actually, and also engagement, and we actually found that even just after two weeks, engagement had actually increased by over 20%. So we could see how many students were using VBOX each week. So it's definitely worth something that um, I would definitely recommend it. Now, we do have some advantages of VBOX. As we said, students really enjoyed the activities. It was fully anonymous, so we couldn't pinpoint which students had which answers and actually the students really appreciated that. Now, while I use it with PowerPoint, mainly you don't have to use it with PowerPoint. You can use everything just in a web browser. So you can use it in sort of practical workshop scenarios as well, which is really good. There's multiple activities and also an anonymous Q&A function. And the Q&A function was really, really important in terms of students being able to ask questions and not feel as though they were being pressured to have a name against those questions. Now, I've hopefully given a demonstration that it's fairly easy to use. There's loads of help um, sort of resources on the VVOX website as well, which you can use. And that's essentially where I started off trying to understand what VVOX, um, what VVOX was. And over COVID, I used it online as well. It was just as engaging online as it was um, offline. We know that during COVID, a lot of students disengage with lectures. So what I did try to do is embed VBOX a little bit more in the lectures when it was online, because the students would then be a bit more involved. There are some disadvantages. So it's not just the case of, you know, I'm 100% for VBOX. It is costly if, if you're an institution and only one or two members of staff use it. Um, it can be quite costly. And that is why Loughborough have encouraged it to be used widely. So now a lot of staff across many subjects use it. I did find it could be too repetitive if the same activities were used over and over again. So as an educator, it's about finding the right balance of using types of questions or different types of activities. Now, beforehand, when you saw my account with different sessions in, 
the first time I used that after the first year, I had so many different things in my Vbox account. I got really confused about what I had used for different sessions. So at the end of the year, just make sure that you do sort of tidy up your account as well. And we did find that with the lectures and the seminars, there was still some disengagement, but Vbox allows you to keep track of this. So if you find that some students are disengaging, you can sort of try and encourage engagement a little bit more. So in Loughborough, we um, and in some of the institutions as well, we haven't just used Vbox. We've used quite a few other different things. Now, when I worked down at Oxford Brookes University, I used um, Kahoot, which it's very similar <laughs> to Vbox in that um, you can use it online, you can use it on a phone. And you can provide students with different activities and multiple choice questions. But one of the issues is that you've got a limit to how many students can use it. So this is why we tend not to use it in Loughborough. In Loughborough, we have massive cohorts of students. And Kahoot is, I would say, more appropriate for cohorts of maybe 30 to 40 students. It does also have a bit of a basic range of activities, so only one or two things that you can do with it. It's not terrible. I'm absolutely not saying that. I'd quite happily use it again. But for me, Vbox um, gives more opportunity to have a wide range of activities in there. At Loughborough, the one thing that we do use is something called H5P, and we do embed this into our Moodle um, sort of virtual learning environment, so we call this Learn. There are many, many activities that you can do, and I'll give you a quick, um, a quick example of a couple in a moment's time, but this is not to be used in a lecture situation. This is mainly for independent activities, give students activities that they can um, do in their own time, for example, sort of as little homework type tasks. We have found this more successful in our large cohort. So we used it last year with a cohort of 355 students. And what we did is Dr. David Maidman is one of my colleagues um, and myself used this within a first year cognitive research module. So David developed loads of different activities related to his lectures. I had, <coughs> excuse me, some different on-demand activities and I did mine in relation to those. And we gave students different drag and drop activities. There were also activities where students could fill in missing words and you get feedback straight away to say whether those are incorrect or correct. And what we did as well is we gave students a piece of coursework to write a lab report. So we then gave students activities which related to each section of the article that that lab report was based upon as well. So we gave them information about the introduction and they would just click on images and different bits of information would pop up as well. The one thing that we're just starting to use now is Socrative. So Socrative can be used inside and outside of lectures. And what we are trying to do now is I'm trying to implement this with the same cohort that I did with Vivox last year. So I haven't taught this group of students at the minute. I'll be teaching them in semester two. But what I am planning on doing is developing different worksheets um, where students can complete them each week. The original idea was to have these as assessed worksheets, but academic registry, um, we're not a fan of us having multiple assessments across the module. So now we are just going to use them as more informal um, types of feedback as well. The good thing with Socrative is that you can get a free version to test it out. And then if you know if it's really good, you can then use it in future instances as well. And these are just some examples of the types of quizzes that you can do. So with Socrative, you can either give students a PDF quiz, so put it on your learning environments, or there is also um, an app and an online environment where students can complete the questions as well. So whichever version the students um, would like to do. So what's next in terms of, you know, Vivox and the tools that we have used? Well, what we're doing now is we're going to try and attempt to do what we've done with Vivox with Socrative. So we are going to apply for a teaching innovation award to try and get some funding to implement Socrative across multiple cohorts. So at the minute, I'm just piloting Socrative with um, the group that I'm going to be working with in semester two. And as far as I'm aware, Socrative is not implemented at Loughborough University. So we're going to try and do a preliminary investigation just after Christmas. If that works, we'll then apply for a teaching innovation award to then hopefully get the funding 
to then allow us to implement this with a much larger cohort as well. So we've seen it successful with Vivox. We're going to try and do it with another piece of software now. But just to conclude, um, we know the form of feedback is important for students. Vivox can be used. We've also got other pieces of software such as Kahoot and Socrative that we've also talked about as well. And it's not just a case of implementing them in lectures. Consider the audience and don't overuse the technology because we don't want to get students used to using the technology too much. Think about student numbers. If you've got a cohort of 350 students, which is the most suitable piece of software to use? And then finally, just use the technology that is best for you. If you're more comfortable in using Vbox, use that. If you're more comfortable in using another piece of software, then go with that. If students can see you're comfortable with that software, they will likely be quite happy to use it as well. But for now, thank you very much for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask those. Laura, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. We'll give you a second just to rest your voice and have That's some okay. and Thanks very much. Cover from that. So thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Laura? Helena, I see your hand up. Oh, that was a great talk. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Um, it was actually more a comment um, on something. So we use Mentimeter or we yes. have Mentimeter in Glasgow. And I, from looking and testing both systems, they look very, very similar to each other. Yeah. I couldn't see much of a difference. But um, so one of the extra use cases that I have used my uh, Mentimeter for is um, producing materials for discussion for students the next year. Yes. So I teach social psychology and in one of the classes we were talking about norms and it was very interesting because like last year, basically, when we did this online and stuff like that, one of the norms is that everybody was wearing masks and this yes. year, of course, that has changed. So there's quite a few other things that you can do and that's kind of one of the uses that I found for this that it sort of helps students to also feel a little bit more confident because um, they see what students in the past have answered and that can give them some ideas about how they can answer it because I think that's one of the other barriers that very often um, I think students have is that they're not quite sure how they should answer or what exactly the parameters are or um, or if they've got the right ideas and stuff like that so but anyway I thought this was really really great oh no that's fine thank you yeah we, we have used Mentimeter in the past um, but we've we've had issues with sort of sharing student ideas um, and I think the university is moving to, more towards sort of as much of an anonymous thing as possible. Um, so, I mean, I've used Mentimeter in past institutions and, you know, I've really enjoyed using that as well. Um, so it's yeah, you're quite correct. It's it's another very good piece of software that, that can be used. Um, for now, I think for me, it was just the, the novelty of Evox. I'd, I'd never used it before. Uh, whereas Mentimeter, I'd use it for years and years, and I was a little—I wasn't bored of it, but it was just something that I felt as though I would implement, and that—that that was it. So what I would then do is I would then be sitting thinking, what else can I do? What else can I implement? And this is where Vivox came in. I've—I've I've been quite heavily involved with um, Vivox themselves. So we're, um, there's been a Vivox community developed. So we're trying to share ideas between educators and non-educators as well. Um, but no, definitely meant to meet is one of those ones. It's definitely up there alongside Vbox. I, I do agree with that. Okay. Great. Uh, Phil, I see your hand up. I just see Cosmos got a couple in the chat. So okay if I go to that first. So Cosmos asking, how is Vbox different? Well, how is Vbox different from Mentimeter? I think we've just answered that. Yeah. Integration with PowerPoint looks pretty cool. It does, yeah, I noticed that as well. Does your university expect all students to have a smartphone? And have you encountered issues of digital poverty? Um, we don't expect all students to have a smartphone, no. It's um, what we do is anything that we do on Vbox, we also then put it on our um, virtual learning environments as well. So this is one of the good things about Vbox. Anything that's done in a lecture, we can then put it on online as well. So um, after I give you a live demonstration, there were some examples. What we tend to do is copy and paste those and also put them onto the, the learning environment as well. So if students are in the lecture and they don't have a smartphone, they don't have a tablet, that's absolutely fine. Um, some people may, may assume that a lot of students do own smartphones, but obviously we know as educators that's 
100% not the case. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're having in the past and uh, encountered some issues with students. But what we do is when I run my VBOX activities, um, I kind of scan the room. And if I can see that there's quite a few students without smartphones, for I, I don't ask them why. Um, what I then do is I tend to just that's when I'll back it up with sort of the hands up or, you know, ask students to then have a two minute discussion. And that just helps sort of, you know, support those students who maybe don't have sort of the, the digital um, devices on there as well. That's great. Thanks very much, Laura. And that was a good question, Cosma. Thank you. Phil, you got a question? Hello, um, Laura. Nice to meet you. After, I think I've been following your stuff on Twitter for years. So just <laughs> first off, nice to say to actually say hi and put a voice to the, the, the Twitter badge. Um, I, like I use many mirrors, some of the stats lectures we use and kind of some of the form, Microsoft forms is Q and A after. So I like I do really see the benefit of it. I would just kind of more kind of want to pick up maybe on your question about your appointment about repetitiveness and kind of what if you've got any insight into what is the sweet spot? Because I guess part of my concern sometimes with this is um, an almost an emperor's new clothes novelty impact. Yeah. Like in the few lectures that are using it, it looks cool and funky. But if every lecture was using it, then it's just another damn thing to do in the lecture type thing. Do you know? Yeah, and yeah. Do you have any insight, like, like how many kind of times you would suggest it? Like? Um, so normally our lectures at Loughborough are either one hour or two hours. And in a one hour lecture, a lot of the time I tend not to use it as much because you can just get the students to sit and talk for a minute or two. Um, and normally in a one hour lecture, students are not as disengaged, they're not as distracted, but it's mainly in the two hour lecture. So in a two hour lecture, um, what I'll do is I'll after every 20 minutes, I'll either do a VBOX activity or I'll also give students a phone break. So that's not so much doing a VBOX activity, um, but I'll alternate between them. So I won't use VBOX for the whole session, because as you've said there, that's, you know, we, we will sort of get get a bit bored of it and students will they'll be thinking, oh, you know, we're using VBOX again. Uh, but what I make sure as well is it, it often depends upon what I'm teaching. So if I'm teaching areas of biological psychology, it's sort of a bit more complex. So that's why I use more things such as word clouds to see what students know first. Whereas if it's sort of areas of developmental psychology, I've then used more multiple choice questions when we've talked about different theories and what they have um what the theories are, are kind of suggesting as well so it's it is it is going to be different for everyone but I, I would sort of maybe four or five times a lecture but mix it up a little bit have some discussion activities use Vbox um and do a, a few a few different things what I wouldn't advise is using too much technology in one go um, so you wouldn't want to use Mentimeter and then go on to VBOX now to something else. Um, just sort of stick with one of them and just space them out in the lecture. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a case of giving students a range of activities. I, I wouldn't advise sort of using it like once every five minutes. I think everybody would, would get sick of it then. Um, but yeah, every 20 minutes or so is my sort of standard thing. Super. That's great. Okay, any other questions from anyone else? Okay, I've, I've just got one of the questions um, and I'll let you go, Laura, because I know that voice of you. you must That's have all right, yeah. Yeah, coffee tea or something. But it's just one when you were talking about the um, the feedback being actively attended to and acted upon. And, yeah. and, I, and I immediately started to cover that from the student perspective. And I wondered yes. whether you were going to go on and talk about some of the things you did to support the students but it was interesting because you came from a staff perspective and said yes. I, I go and do this and, go. and I thought okay um that, that's really interesting I just wondered whether you had anything about um creating a, a repository for the students and encourage them to engage with that or really just being active and interactive and with a piece of software in the lecture was enough um, what we tend to do is um, every time we introduce something new into the lectures, if it's designed for feedback, we'll directly explain to the students why we're using it and how we're using it. And we we'll find that that alone encourages the students to take part. Um, th that's pretty much it, really. We, we don't sort of, um, you know, we don't force students to do it. We don't, you know, we do say to students everything's optional. Um, but we're just we're trying to explain to them 
the importance of taking part in the activities because um and what I tend to do is in if I'm teaching for a full semester and I find that things are going on at the start of students and not understanding certain things um if I then implement activities based upon what I found in previous lectures I'll just directly say that to students so for example if we're if I'm teaching areas of cognition and there's a theory that students are, are not fully clear on the next lecture will maybe have a VVOX activity and I'll directly say to the students you know I got the impression that you didn't understand this um, so we're going to do a, li a little bit more work on it uh, but I also encourage the students to, to actively email if they are struggling I'd, I'd prefer a student to email and say look I'm struggling because um, mm -hmm. sometimes even we get the wrong end of it students may appear to be struggling but they might be quite all right with everything um, so it's, it's a case of just getting feedback off the students a little bit as well and us explaining to the students why we're what how and why we're changing different things sure Laura that's great is, has anyone got any final questions or will I let Laura go and have a very large glass of water <laughs> and rest that voice for the rest of the evening thank you <laughs> thank you ever so much Laura we really appreciate your time today and we hope you feel a lot better soon thank I you think I think you're getting there and thank I am I'm, I'm getting there yeah definitely Good, good, good. And thanks very much, uh, very much everybody for coming along. Really appreciate it. And have a nice evening. Thanks oh, very the, much. The, the next tile, just to, as a reminder to everybody, and uh, just making sure that I've covered everything, the next tile um, session will be on the 24th of January in the morning because we have uh, uh, people joining us from uh, New Zealand, UK, South Africa. So we're starting at half nine and it's on quality provision and support for distance doctoral students. So. Hopefully see you all then. Thanks everyone. Bye.